the amount of sophistication that companies have to have over their data governance and their data control and their data harvesting and insight creation to have really great generative AI is going to be a journey that is going to take months and years, not days or weeks. My guest today is CJ Banga. CJ is a principal with PwC. She leads their U.S. software and digital platform practice and in her 14 plus years with PwC, she's worked with some of the largest and most innovative companies on the planet. I found it energizing to talk with her and I thought she was exceptionally thoughtful and insightful as we discussed the opportunities and the risks associated with AI, the current state of attribution modeling and the future of digital marketing in both agency and corporate settings. You won't wanna miss this episode of The Digital Clinic. Tell me a little bit about your professional background. It's very impressive. Uh, you clearly work with very interesting, uh, very large clients in fascinating spaces. So tell me about what you do and how you came to be doing this work. I appreciate the question and for better or worse, it was a happy accident. I come from a small family, blue collar family, teachers, plumbers, roofers, electricians, and finding consulting and having been a consultant for the last 19 years came through starting a job out of college, having somebody that I worked with say, what are you doing here? Mm. It's a you know, 38.75 hour work week. You're here 50, 60 hours trying to make sure we ship new code on time, get everybody into the application. You really should be at the big four. Yeah. I had no idea what it was. So I put myself through undergrad um, and couldn't make some of the interview days that the big firms have. And so it was literally just somebody that I worked with my first job out of college that directed me to um, my former firm. And then I've been with obviously PwC for 14 and a half years. And your role with PwC is as a principal and you lead their digital transformation practice. Is that correct? So I'm, I have a few titles. We like to- I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, we, um, I know it's, I joke that it's small hats and you just try to keep them carefully balanced. Yeah. So I, I look after our software and digital platform subsector. So that's, you know, big tech clients who have SaaS business models, ad supported business models, things like that. I also help with the media subsector and author many of PwC's perspectives on the future of advertising and the future of marketing, but really I'm just a non-CPA partner, so principal, who serves clients in, in tech and media and really I'm pretty fortunate to be in the space. Can you give examples of the type of work that you do with clients? I will give you one of my favorite project examples. Okay. So I had a client who faced declining revenue growth. They were launching new products into the market. It was getting more and more complicated for them to sell and they had a profitability problem. They both saw their competitors being much more aggressive with going after their client set, and they knew that they had to break the paradigm between costs rising at a rate greater than revenue, but they didn't want to do it irresponsibly, and they wanted to do it in a way that harmonized their global community. And so we had the opportunity to work with 60 countries around the world, figure out how they made things work, what was similar, what was different, and how we unified it. And for you know a large digital advertising publisher, we helped them transform the model from, from nuts to bolts. So new ways of working, better ways of collaborating, better ways of scaling. And I realize I'm using a ton of consulting speak. I'm sorry, I've been one for 19 years. It's sure. a hazard of the job. Yeah. Um, but the reason that I really loved that project and that opportunity is I was thinking it, of it as, hey, we're going to roll a new tool out. We're going to change the global processes from prospect to cash you know, to get this team fit um, to better compete and win in the market and to make them relevant for the long term. And I didn't understand the importance of engaging humans in a really deep and meaningful way from a change management perspective and in making sure that when we're doing projects, we're doing them with people, not to them, and in a way where they understand. They understand why you're changing. They understand the benefit for them. They understand that new tools and processes can make their job easier. Um, and so it was just a great learning opportunity. I also learned a ton traveling around the world. <laughs> like, um, I didn't realize, you know, some of the folks that we talked to in Japan if they didn't fully deliver on their commitment, they had to go personally apologize. And so they would then like undervalue all of their contracts in terms of how much advertising inventory they were selling because they didn't want to underdeliver. Uh -huh. And so once you understood that there was a deep cultural reason for it, it enables you to do better design choices as you're trying to get them onto the, the global standards. In that example engagement, were you able to work from strategic ideation all the way through fruition and implementation? Strategy through execution, yes. Is that typical? You know, one of the uh, one of the knocks on consulting is that consultants come in and deliver ideas and then walk away. And it sounds like that's not the model for you at all. It sometimes is the model because that's what clients ask for. Yeah. But I think that, you know, if you say the best consultants are 
valued partners who care just as much about your business as you do, if not more, and they really are committed to driving results, then ideally, you know, they are there to make sure that you go all the way through to execution and you actually deliver on the promise of, of what you want. We even price some of our projects that way. So it's not a reads and hours conversation. It's a conversation where it's a value share. Hmm. And we may get um, a bonus if we are able to successfully deliver on the business case or on, on the initial premise. I think sometimes, you know, clients will say, I've got great project managers. I've got great, great developers. I've got Six Sigma certified process re-engineers. Like, I just want you to come in and inventory the pain points, pull in industry best practices, tell me what we should do, and then like we'll figure it out. Sometimes they are successful. Sometimes we have to go back and say, hey, like, let's help you kind of get the ship back on and, and clarify the questions and make sure that everyone understands why they're doing what they're doing, yeah. the benefits in it for them, and the things that need to be true for it to be successful and on final execution. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about digital transformation? We absolutely can. Okay. Another big consultant buzzword that I get the sense isn't very well understood. Can you unpack the definition of digital transformation and then talk about what it means in the real world in some of your engagements as well? It's a good question. And it's one that because the word has been mercilessly abused by people who either want to weaponize it as if you don't digitally transform, you're irrelevant mm -hmm. or use it to drive cloud revenue or online revenue. I think that the potential of what it could be often gets lost in conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is digital transformation is embracing the fact that since the internet came to exist, so much of our life as a consumer is grounded in these digitally enabled experiences, whether it's a pure play digital experience, a digitally augmented experience, or something where there are digital underpinnings to how you are connecting with the world. Those B2C experiences have a way of propagating into B2B journeys and B2B experiences as well. And if you're using technology thoughtfully and prudently, and you're getting rid of business models that don't make a lot of sense, then you're digitally transforming, mm -hmm. right? You're using technology in incredibly helpful ways. I think what we're going to see with generative AI is there's going to be a new wave of digital transformation that is not about, are you using great technology systems to underpin your business? Do your systems connect? Are your humans upskilled on how to use technology in really highly productive and effective ways? And you have flexibility in your business model where you're able to light up and wind down you know, cloud capabilities as you need it. And as you grow and it's really, really easy, it's not something where you have to go stand up a new data center. If you increase your customer set by 20%, you can just have your cloud provider light up some new servers. Gen AI is going to be interesting to see what it does to the lexicon and the taxonomy around the role that digital plays in our lives. And I think even with the outage that we saw somewhat right. recently through, you know, a deployed system, it shows that the dependence on digital technology does have risk and it does have downside. We see that with social media. We see that with concerns about job loss with Gen AI. We see a lot of different propagations of it. What is your view of, of digital transformation or like how do you think about it? Because I think my view tends to be very grounded in stronger tech foundations, more productive workforce elevated understanding of how technology can, you know, move the business forward with flexibility and everything else. But when you approach it, like, do you have a different definition that I no, that's over? That's consistent with, with our understanding as well. And the way that we approach it, I think because we're a performance driven marketing agency, we tend to think about it very pragmatically. So we're thinking about the ways that we can employ uh, digital systems, new digital technology, new data to deliver business value as quickly and as efficiently as possible. We tend, I think sometimes to our detriment, to come in at it from uh, a limited strategic perspective. Yeah. Strategic with regard to the channels and the campaigns that we're managing. And we sometimes forget to come at it from an organizational perspective and think about digital transformation for the organization overall and the way that that could then, by extension, enable performance for the business. So if we take my very broad enterprise grade view and we then we translate it to the marketing and advertising arena, I think that's where things get really interesting, right? Because if you go back even five or 10 years, one of the big arguments from an agency perspective or a marketing perspective was, are you spending enough online? Mm -hmm. Have you embraced the fact that consumers are spending so much time online and digital underpins so much of their experience that if your ad dollars are not effectively flowing to digital channels, you're not actually effectively engaging your consumers and there are a lot that you've left behind. I think every year that passes, um, and one of the things I do on behalf of PwC is help publish with the Interactive Advertising Bureau our Digital Ad Revenue Report, 
every year that passes, you continue to see digital advertising in the US and in established markets around the world grow at rates that are greater than the other form factors, because I do think people are catching up. I also think out-of-home advertising is one of my favorites, um, because if you have a digital out-of-home ad, it's this incredibly powerful like palette where folks are not watching television shows at the same time all the right. more consistently, right? And so if you want to have a broad reach, digital out of home in certain neighborhoods or in many neighborhoods combined can actually be interesting to think about, right? Um, same goes with performance marketing if you're looking at search and some of these other form factors. So the digital transformation advertising marketing combination, I do think gets interesting because mm -hmm. it's still hard to convince brands and to convince you know, folks that may not either be technically savvy, may not fully understand the form factor, may be worried about what where their ad's going to show up and whether or not they're really going to drive the ROI. And yet the industry as a whole just continues to grow and, and have pretty impressive growth year in and year out, inclusive of form factors like video game ads and other things as well. Yeah. You mentioned several things that I'd love to dig into. So first, AI, very much in the zeitgeist. Uh, when AI uh, first uh, became on everyone's scene. radar, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the initial fear was, oh, this is going to eat everyone's lunch. Yeah. It's going to be about cost reduction, elimination of jobs, increasing efficiency with technology at the expense of human beings. Yeah. That is largely proven not to be the case, with some exceptions. It seems now, when I've heard you talk about this, that the emphasis now in the value being delivered is much more about um, enabling additional revenue, enabling additional creativity. It's an augmentation as opposed to uh, a technology that displaces humans. Can you unpack that a little bit as well? A lot of my thinking on this was shaped by the former CEO of IBM who said, you know, AI is not going to replace your job. Other humans who use AI is going to replace your job. Right. And I think for many industries, that'll be at least partially true. Now, there may become, become use cases where we decide that it doesn't make sense for humans to do that work anymore and an AI powered robot may step in for certain parts of medial labor. And there are going to be other jobs that are so fundamentally transformed that the volume of people needed on it could also potentially change. But the premise that, you know, first of all, and, and we chatted about this before, you know, starting, starting the discussion today, we talked about it a few weeks ago, the amount of sophistication that companies have to have over their data governance and their data control and their data harvesting and insight creation to have really great generative AI is going to be a journey that is going to take months and years, not days or weeks. Right. Now, there are bespoke use cases and really fabulous creative tools where you can generate something AI powered like that and do a tremendous amount of experimentation. Mm -hmm. So there are really advanced Gen AI use cases, the conversational AI capabilities, the art rendering capabilities, um, the editing capabilities, other things like this. But I think that we went so quickly out of the gate with a lot of focus on how transformative Gen AI was going to be. And I don't know that enough folks were deep in it to see, hey, it's actually going to be a journey that looks like this. And that journey is not purely linear and it's not purely quick. It's going to have a lot of different considerations that impact the, the pacing, including things like labor unions for the fields that have some of the more advanced, present, really clear Gen AI use cases and value props. It seems to me that when we all started initially playing with Gen AI, it was very exciting that it could produce a result very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it became clear that, oh, it can produce a result very quickly, but the result's usually bad. It's usually 80 or 85% of what you actually needed. And the last 15% really mattered and took an exponentially greater amount of time and due diligence and investment and refinement uh, to get. Uh, and that still seems to be the case. But I guess I'd like to, to get your perspective on this. My, my perspective is that if you're dealing with a task, particularly in digital marketing, where the task has been or can be clearly documented and it is repeatable, uh, and so it, it is a process, that is a task that is likely to be automated by AI. The, the value that remains in digital marketing, at least in an agency, agency like ours, is in true strategy, deep expertise, and in creativity, and in orchestration. It's not really an implementation anymore. One of my favorite Gen AI stories came from a, a panel I facilitated at Cannes. And it was the opportunity with like a creative asset, like let's say you're advertising a car, to like film 
the automobile, you know, going through right. rugged train, whatever, but be able to like personalize that ad so that the car looks like it's in snow or it's on a beach or it's somewhere that is going to more authentically connect with the viewer of the ad. That's kind of neat. Yeah. And it's kind of cool and it's not going to be appropriate for every brand. Um, but I think that your point of, you know, first of all, for those that may not be as deep in the space, AI has been powering digital marketing for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that's been in place for a very long time. Now, Gen AI and the Gen AI use cases have continued to mature at an accelerated rate over the last year and a half plus. But I do think that understanding humans, so being able to build a marketing strategy and a marketing campaign that's deeply grounded in both consumer truth and brand truth and matchmaking to find that right opportunity, and then using AI capabilities to optimize the tactics so that you're not having to manually look a bunch of stuff up on you know, building audiences from scratch. Like you can have audience recommendation engines, you can have help with creative automation, things like that. Yeah. With a human, I hate to say human insight engine because it's such a lame term, but with the right human engagement and understanding kind of that deep essence of what makes us as consumers want to connect with a brand and want to connect with a product or service, mm -hmm. I think is really important to not lose sight of. Yeah, I agree. A few months ago, Sam Altman made a very provocative comment and claimed that in, I think he said three years, AI would be doing 95% of what digital agencies are doing today. What's your reaction to that comment? Whenever someone makes a comment that is visionary and transformative, you know, you sometimes have to ask, did they make that comment because they really believe it? Or did they make that comment because it's going to be something that grabs headlines and is provocative and gets people thinking? Right. I do not know him personally. Sure. I have to imagine that there is a world where 95% of the work could be done by Gen AI. But if you were going to put it side by side, like a 95% Gen AI controlled digital marketing agency versus a really intentionally using Gen AI in the right areas mm -hmm. marketing agency, you know, the, your customers aren't going to want to call up a Gen AI robotic agent to explain to them, like, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what my customers like. Here are the things that we've tried in the past and they haven't been effective or that, you know, we've we've tested and learned on together. Like I, I think that there are portions of the ecosystem that do not add value in the way that they should. And those portions could be automated and augmented by Gen AI capabilities, like no question. But the things that do add value are going to be Gen AI powered, not Gen AI eliminated. Yeah. In my view. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I think there are some agencies where 95% of the work they're doing could be, should be automated by Gen AI, but that's a different issue. I think what we talked a little bit around this, but uh, conceptually or categorically, what is AI good for? Do you think in the future and what is it not good for? It's interesting because sometimes like I have, um, AI capabilities, you know, integrated into like my email and it'll draft the response for me. Yeah. And it makes me feel. Like, I don't care about the person on the other end if I use the Gen AI enabled response. Yeah. And that's my own change management learning curve. It's actually just a productivity enabler, and it's something that can and should be used heavily, right? There's also the capability to transcribe your meetings, summarize your action notes. Like, these are things that, like, I don't like doing, I get no value from, by all means, embrace Gen AI use cases right. and value add, right? I also think, you know, if you're doing quality control processes over financial statements, or if you're going through and you're trying to figure out like what the insight is from the data, not having to manually read like 10 or 20,000 rows of advertising performance information and having a Gen AI friend who makes recommendations to you so that you can be smarter and then ask more provocative questions and then get to really great recommendations. There are use cases there as well. The business model reinvention portion of Gen AI, it's a little bit too early to say exactly how that's going to play out. But I do think we're starting to see companies think about data monetization. So I have this information on this subset of consumers. Can I then get other people to pay me for this data mm -hmm. on my subset of consumers so that they can plan their digital marketing campaigns, make them smarter, make them more action oriented where they have full cycle investments? I think those are definitely on the horizon for the future and way too early to say exactly how it's going to fully manifest. Yeah. That's a perfect segue to the Internet Advertising Report, which uh, you help to produce every year and is fascinating. There were three themes that were clear in that report. And the first has to do with monetization of data mm -hmm. to enable much more sophisticated targeting. What do you see happening there? 
It's interesting because part of me thinks we're going to have a data is the new gold phase right. over the next few months, few years, where more companies and more industries are going to be really interested in how do I use data in much more compelling ways to train my AI models, to target my marketing efforts, and to really kind of get under the hood of this. There are also, and the IAB um, is the one who did this research, there are like 2,000 privacy regulations plus globally around the world right now right. on who has ultimate power, authority, and control over consumer data, consumer data use, how long a company gets to retain it, GDPR, CCPA, state-by-state -state privacy regulations, things all over the world that are coming in. And so part of me thinks we're going, we're at the beginning point of a data gold rush where we're going to see a lot of companies try to monetize their data, try to get access to other people's data, reinvent their business models with it, and really try to get a lot smarter about how they're thinking about investment of capital, investment of marketing spend. And then the regulators are going to come in and it's going to change and then be transformed again. Part of me thinks that the ability to fully and effectively monetize that data is going to be hampered by many of the systems that a lot of industries sit on. And so it may not be a gold rush. It may be another hype cycle. Yeah. So I'm a little torn on like the full scale opportunity, but I do think it's at least worth considering and exploring because the last thing anybody wants to do is waste money, right? Right especially money that's designed to help you unlock growth and attract new consumers, which is the whole point of marketing. Yeah. As we've seen over the last couple of years, any significant shift in privacy regulations, particularly in healthcare, with the broadened interpretation of HIPAA, which now is also in question because of recent legal decisions. So everything is up in the air around uh, HIPAA privacy regulations. Uh, as you said, there are 19 states that have their own privacy regulations. I think there are some 350 other privacy, potential privacy laws that are pending. Yeah. Uh, and what that suggests to me is that any forward looking, any prudent business should do everything that they can to take control of their own destiny and not be beholden to a third party, third party data, third party cookies, develop a first party data strategy, figure this stuff out on your own, develop the direct relationships you need to be effective. And when we've been able to do that, the performance is also much better as well. It's interesting because, you know, if you go back to like the 1960s, the content, and I'm using a media example, but like the content producers relied on someone else to be their distribution vehicle. So someone else knew, you know, these are the households that this is showing up and someone else knew, you know, these are how many of the customers are churning every month and this is how much they're willing to pay for a subscription and, you know, potentially, you know, more research on them and beyond. What happened with the internet and what happened with the streaming is you started to see these direct-to-consumer businesses who are owning the entire value chain mm -hmm. and realizing how incredibly powerful that can be because not only, to your point, are you reducing your dependency on somebody else for the success of your business, you are also able to get such a deeper understanding of your customers, who they are, what they care about, what they react to, what you're not going to get any engagement on. And then you can get into the other part of like a really great marketing motion, which is not only am I bringing new customers in the door, but when I get them, I delight them, I keep them, they're right. loyal, they're a referral source, and they are someone where I'm genuinely adding value to their life with my products or services, or at least serving some baseline need if you're talking about, you know, some of the foundational companies out there. Yeah. So we've talked about two of the three trends that were highlighted in this report, one related to monetization of data, two related to increased privacy regulation. And the third is this collapsing of the customer journey, the customer funnel from discovery to purchase or consumption. Can you uh, share a little bit more about your perspective there and what you're seeing? It depends on if it's B2B or B2C, because I think it's both collapsing and expanding depending on your customer set, your segment, yeah. what you're looking at. Forrester came out with some really great research that showcased the average B2B customer journey was like 27 touch points. Mm -hmm. And it's everything from, you know, doing an internet search, watching a product video, talking to their friends, going, <laughs> going to your webinar, like all these different things that all are like this new consideration pattern. And there aren't a lot of B2B companies that can connect those purchase signals or right. drive the consideration. The same is true on the B2C side as well. You're not necessarily going to know if somebody's watching a short form social video where they did a you know makeup tutorial and that drove them into the store to buy your lipstick, or if it was because you have a really beautiful product ad, or if it was because you did some awareness you know building through digital video or all of these other factors. And so, I think the you know owning the value chain, owning the consumer engagement, and then being able to adjust those signals back into your marketing and sales engine 
are in- incredibly powerful and the touch points in the journey can very much be compressed, especially if you look at shoppable ads, mm-hmm. where the discovery to the purchase just can happen in a microsecond. Right. Whereas for other things, it gets much more expansive. But I think for digital commerce and retail media, that's where you're, you're seeing the form factor grow so quickly is it's measurable, it's attributable, and it happens in the moment. You're not waiting you know, X weeks and collecting 20 plus data touch points to try to show the conversion. Well, and it it seems to me it's increasingly problematic to even attempt to collect those touch points. We go back to privacy regulations and things like cookie consent um, and the fact that you you can't track most of those touch points now in many contexts, which brings me to attribution modeling. Yeah. So given this context, given the issues with privacy regulations and cookie consent and the multitude of touch points, how should we be thinking about attribution modeling? And by extension, modeling that enables us to understand and project where we should be spending media. Attribution modeling is a really interesting area and one I think kind of depends on the brand, like depends on the marketer, because you can get incredibly sophisticated, 100 plus data points, fully fed model, throw in some great data science, some, some AI analysis and other things and come up with a solution that looks like pretty interesting and pretty beautiful. Yeah. Will they, will they trust it? Right. And I think that, you know, the future of attribution modeling is something you probably have a view on as well. I'm, I'm imagining where there are things that when the internet first came to bear and when internet advertising first started growing, what attribution modeling meant then versus what it means now are also very different. Oh yeah. And so I think the complexity that has come out of the last 20 plus years is creating an environment where like, yes, attribution modeling is still expected and it's still part of the ecosystem, but more companies that I I work with or that I've seen are trying to simplify down their attribution model while still collecting more rich data insights, including their own, you know, CDPs and customer understanding and customer awareness. And it it feels like just an interesting area that's going to continue to have a lot of debate on the right way to do it. Yeah, we see the same thing. We have instances in which we're using media mix modeling and that's very complex and sophisticated, involves data science. And even in the simplified streamlined version still takes weeks or months to build and get to fidelity and you have to continue to train and refine. Yeah. And, and that works, but the complexity also, as you suggest, can create skepticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've proven out the models and that's been good, but the level of effort is really significant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have some clients where it's just super simple attribution modeling. It's this signal, this result, that's it. And that's perfectly fine. And it turns out that that works very well. And we have a third case as well because of HIPAA regulations where we lost all attribution modeling yeah. or all attribution, I should say, all tracking and had to fly blind. And we used our own models and forecasts, and they were as good as the full fidelity attribution modeling that we had before. I love that story. And one of my favorite quotes from when we did the IB Outlook a few years ago was the advertising industry like can get drunk on its own data, and it's never enough data. Right. You just gave an example of when actually sometimes you don't need to bend over backwards and collect 500 data points to try to prove the value of marketing. Like, right. You could come up with an opportunistic model. You can come up with a like. You can come up with all these other kind of different different ways of looking at it. I also think uh, occasionally, you know, companies, especially because the CMO CFO relationship is one that right. can be filled with antagonism and lack of understanding, and you know, the, the two executives speaking very different languages. Attribution modeling is something that you could see being baked in the mind of a finance person, mm-hmm. and then used to hold the marketing person more or less hostage to to showing the results and driving the value. One thing that we found with many of our clients is there are different, better ways to bridge the CMO, CFO gap and to look at it, you know, through new innovative methods that may not be your traditional media mix modeling or may not be, you know, this overly complicated attribution model. So what those are and, and what works for different brands, different industries can vary very much. But I do think that that mindset of we don't need to fight with the finance organization to justify our spend or to prove out that every single dollar was perfectly invested is one that actually can also be transformative for the modern modern marketer in today's age. Yeah. Surprisingly, in that case that I mentioned, it was the CFO who loved the modeling that we did the most. (laughs) Even better. And then 
when we could go in and re-implement analytics in a yeah. compliant manner was the one saying, I'm not, why would we do this? We've got this model, the model yeah. works. And it was the marketers who wanted the data. <laughs> marketers love data. Yeah, I completely understand I am one. Yeah. If we think forward, what sort of talent, what sort of people will populate a marketing organization and how will that differ from the people who are there today? That is a fabulous question and one that's in some ways hard to answer because I think the functional boundaries that exist in marketing today, like so the separation between your analytics and insights team, your AI team, your data analyzers, whatever their brand is, yeah, and your creatives and your media planners and your on and on and on, right? Like all the different functions that exist within a marketing organization, there are going to be portions of some of those roles that are augmented or enhanced with generative AI. And I think part of the question is, will it be in five years and will it be enough that I don't need two completely different skill sets for these two functions? Yeah. I actually need people that are more well-rounded and their understanding of the entire marketing value chain and the entire value cycle. And so the folks I'm recruiting in the future have a more cohesive blend of art and science, mm -hmm. a more cohesive, robust understanding of the storytelling and the creative side and the data and the analytics side, which has been happening for years. Right. But I think some of that could be accelerated slightly. And so when you're looking at marketing talent five years from now, the marketing talent most likely is going to be need to be much more experienced and aware of the customer and the customer expectations and the customer journey and how to collaborate effectively with sales and finance and some of these other functions and a more fulsome understanding of marketing as an art form and as a business growth enabler as well which probably means the, I do this kind of marketing with this kind of skill set, and then I pitch it over the fence to this person who sits over here model is going to start to become much less relevant. I have wondered if the kind of person who will be needed and maybe arguably is needed now is someone who can function, can think beyond the constraints of current convention and process and can think much more about what could be rather than this is the way we've done it. That seems to be the most needed skill, at least where I sit in our agency. Yeah. It's getting out of your own way and realizing, oh, there are 15 new ways to do this. And you have to get really comfortable with being uncomfortable. I love that point. I also think the problem solving in the future and the relationship building to be good at it and to be able to get others to want to do what you want to do. Yeah the ability to use technology thoughtfully and in appropriate ways to contribute to, you know, really great solutions, the ability to, to work across functional values. Like a lot of these things are going to become so foundational to bringing an innovator's mindset to the work. Because again, the pace of change from a tech enablement perspective mm -hmm. has gotten to the point where it's moving faster than we are. Right. And so I think the desire to learn and the desire to constantly be educating yourself and upskilling yourself is is going to be core to every profession, but marketing for sure. Yeah, I agree. We need restless people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those who are never satisfied with the status quo. That's right. Which again, sounds kind of exhausting in some ways. And so then it's the Gen AI use cases I hope, you know, are the most valuable are those that actually make it easier to be effective Yeah. in the things that we do day in and day out and make our lives a little easier because I think some of the problems that we're solving just get harder and harder. The number of people we need to solve them with continues to expand. And there are so many other factors that make the world more complex. So the more we can simplify, the, the better. Yeah, I agree. That's well said. What do you think the agency of the future is? My hypothesis, and it has been for the last couple of years, and it wasn't that I was prescient and saw AI coming. I just had some hunches. My perspective has been that mid to low level Digital marketing is rapidly become commoditized and it's not worth investing in it. Yeah. That the only thing that matters is strategic expertise, deep expertise, that you have to change the agency model and not have five people with a lot of experience and 20 people who are junior who do the work. You need 20 people with a lot of experience who have elasticity of thought, who are creative. Yeah. And that technology is now table stakes for agencies as well. So a digital marketing agency that just does digital advertising and some digital strategy and maybe implements analytics, that also is commoditized. Mm -hmm. That there's a race to the bottom in terms of what people are willing to pay for that. And there's a decreasing value in that as well. And so what we've tried to do is to develop our own proprietary technology mm -hmm. that gives us a leg up 
and to hire increasingly senior people and to really focus on developing strategy as a muscle and an instinct throughout the entire organization. And then we're using AI as much as we can. Um, we use it in some of our practices. We don't, we don't use it for a direct to client deliverable, but we use it to augment a deliverable. Uh, we use it for strategic exploration or, you know, of course, things like synthesizing meetings and all that kind of thing. But we've also built custom GPTs that do some interesting things. Uh, again, getting to uh, my perspective that if something can be really rigorously documented, mm -hmm. AI is good for that. Mm -hmm. We built a GPT that uses Google's content quality rating guidelines. It's a 160 page document that's really detailed. It is a recipe. So we trained a GPT on it and it does a really good job of assessing a website, like as well as a junior strategist would. Yeah. And then you still have to check it you wouldn't give that to a client, but it points you in an interesting direction and you know, gets you 80% of the way there. And so that's sort of the perspective. It's expertise and strategy. It's proprietary technology that gives us a clear point of differentiation. And also because we're small, creates a justification for selecting us. You know, So far, we have started to build our own creative team that may or may not be the right path given the evolution of some of the tools. But uh, in digital advertising in particular, creative seems to be the new optimization. Yeah. So we're not gonna optimize based on data in the same way. We're not going to use uh, automated bidding optimization. We're going to use creative to optimize. And so those are sort of the three pillars that I think are important for a digital marketing agency. And now I would love it if you tell me where I'm wrong. If AI is replacing the junior talent, Yeah. Then, <laughs> where what your... creates the senior talent? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, that's a conundrum. Yeah. I'm not sure how you cultivate them if you aren't bringing them along. You know, for decades, advertising and marketing has been grounded on. I can help. You know, if I'm an agency, I can help you. Yeah. Plan and execute a beautiful campaign that's right. going to drive your business outcomes because I know the consumer set. Sure. Right. I watch this show on a Thursday night. The vast majority of Americans are watching this show on a Thursday night. The world that we're in now has such multi-generational entertainment and media content consumption differences. Yeah. Whether it's the amount they do and do or do not play video games, the amount they are or are not spending in augmented and virtual reality environments, whether they watch short form or long form video. One of my uh, favorite quotes from from Cannes this year, just because it got one of my my fellow colleagues really excited, and then had a very disappointing punchline for him, was long form video is back. But what they meant by long form video was six minute videos. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I think that the modern marketer is dealing with a world that is significantly more fragmented and diverse in terms of the kinds of experiences that consumers are looking for. Some are based, you know, you can somewhat simplify based on age, but that's even not a great proxy for it. Yeah. The language that it's in the culture it represents, the values it showcases, right? So if your junior talent is now being augmented or replaced by Gen AI, you don't know where your senior talent's gonna come from in the future. And you're missing that I've hired people who help me understand mm. the younger generational preference patterns. So how does the you know agency of the future close close that gap as well? And mind you, that method has always been deeply flawed, right? right. Because we we can't look at the world that we live in and assume it's the world that all of the target customers of every brand that you're working with also are considering, right? Like there's a lot more that should go into it and historically hasn't. So it could be a great forcing function. Yeah. But what's your perspective on, on that side of the equation? Well, I don't have a great perspective on that, except to say that that aspect, the truly creative aspect of digital marketing, developing a new campaign, developing a new brand is not something that we pretend that we do. Instead, when I say creative is a new optimization, I really mean we're focused on creative to drive campaign optimization. Mm -hmm. And when we work with clients, uh, our reason for being and the, the reason that we have such long term relationships is that we help them solve their very toughest digital problems. And so that tends not to be coming up with a super creative campaign. That tends to be for us uh, figuring out how to bring all of the data together in a modeling environment that actually creates insights and reports that are actionable, how to create the pipes that enable us to feed that in either through the insights in an analyst or through a data feed into a platform, how to build 
uh, web experiences that drive conversion. But I don't have an answer to the creative side of things. So I don't know that anyone does. Yeah. Or those who do <laughs> may, may have a, uh, a an agenda that they're trying to push. And then I think, listen, my, my perspective on the agency of the future, I think that agencies, you know, in, in the days of Mad Men, were used to holding a lot of power and control. Yeah. Whether that was negotiating like really competitive pricing with the large publishing houses, the large TV networks, the large magazines, the large everything else, whether that was, you know, being so much viewed as the expert, that kind of old school belief of like, yes, I have other agencies that I'm competing with, but I am able to hold my own in the room just mm -hmm. because of the environment at the time is one that I think the agency of the future really needs to completely shed. Right. Because the power is in the hands of the consumers and the power is in the hands of the buyer. And I think that there are brands who for years have felt like, you know, they they needed to have more innovation with their agency partner. They needed to have a better client experience. They needed to have a tech enabled agency. They needed to have an agency that cared about them mm -hmm. and was committed to their success. And so I think the agencies that really thrive today are incredibly client centric, outcomes oriented, easy to work with, transparent, yep. trustable, like trustable, trusted. I think there are a lot of those factors that come in and of course, innovative and creative and bringing a lot of, you know, the, the innate tools to bear, but there's a, there's a little bit of a mindset shift I think that is needed for the agencies that are going to compete and win in the future where, you know, you cannot be the going to a four hour, you know, cocktail lunch and giving a pitch that, you know, one of your junior staffers came up with for you, which is a terrible oversimplification and, sure. and dramatized through through television, but I think that that client obsession element really needs to be there. Yeah, I agree. And I think by extension or by implication, uh, agencies that play well with others. So the sharp elbows and I'm trying to claw business from you model that used to exist is not one that we ever employed at sometimes very much to our disadvantage when we encountered it in others. But I think we succeed when we're very collaborative and as you said, very open. And and that by definition is client centric, right. right? Consulting is a service industry. Yeah. Being an agency is a service industry. And understanding that you are there to help your client get outsized results yeah. and a high degree of confidence that they can drive their business forward in the way they need to is the thing that will help humans be relevant, yeah. not fully replaced by Gen AI or AI. Um, and also means, yeah, partnering with others and collaborating well on behalf of the client, not on behalf of your own interests. As I listen to you, I do realize that I, I do have a perspective on creative, kind of a heretical perspective. And it is that the value of the pitch and the concept mm -hmm. is to me significantly diminished because the initial germ of the idea and the concept has value. But uh, as I alluded to, if creative is the new optimization, it's the variations mm -hmm. on that pitch. It's the variations on the concept and the extension of that concept in a way that tunes it to drive performance that really delivers business value. You can still be true to the original notion, but the notion is only the first relatively small step. Yeah. There's a lot that comes after that in a way that I think hasn't been so true in the past. I agree with that. And I think the, like looking at the idea, content, the creative all the way through the to the distribution method. If you're talking about optimizing creative for a search campaign versus a mobile display ad versus all these other different form factors, like understanding the time and space that it's being digested in and what's going to be most effective is right. also really closely linked to that and not being lazy about it. Like you yeah. need to make that creative excellent in every version of itself. Right. Actively every day, all the time. Yeah, my least favorite ad of all time was one that uh, blocked the login page for my fantasy football league. Oh. And it was hysterical because it like won an award for the best performing ad at yeah. a conference I went to later that year. And I'm like, that stupid ad like got so many clicks because on the mobile devices, sure, it like expanded yeah. <laughs> out. And you literally couldn't log into your fantasy football team to like start your lineup without clicking on this dumb ad. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh. So I do think, you know, rooting out false signals is always a good thing as well. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. My least favorite ad right now is one that I just saw as part of the Olympics coverage. And it's a Gemini ad that suggests that you should write a complimentary inspirational letter to your daughter using AI. 
that kind of goes back to my point on email. Like it just kind of, I mean, I know I need to use it to help me more, but I also feel like for those really meaningful personal moments, right? like I, I want to do it myself. Right. If you don't have time to express a sincere and authentic sentiment to your daughter, sort of calls into question your basic humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, but, Just, but would she rather have a Gen AI letter or no letter at all? I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. I'm still not happy with you. That. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. Far more noble source of complaint than mine of I'm irritated. I can't quickly log into my fantasy football league. <laughs> <laughs> it's a values-based decision versus an annoyance-based right. judgment. Both valid, though. Both mm-hmm. valid. Well, this has been really fun. I appreciate it. I enjoyed talking with you. Me as well. Thanks so much for having me in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.